You're listening to Feathers, a podcast of stories about God speaking and His people having just enough faith to believe Him and obey. I hope these stories inspire you and encourage you to take flight in your own faith. I'm your host, Amy Bennett, and this is Episode 10. Well, hey, friends, and welcome to the 10th episode of Feathers. We have hit our first milestone. Um, thanks to those that are just joining us for the first time and those that have been with us. I really, really appreciate it. Um, today we have Amy Sullivan. Amy Sullivan is the author of the nonfiction Christian book entitled When More Is Not Enough and the children's picture book series Gutsy Girls that is coming out in the fall of 2015. Amy shares regularly at her blog, amylsullivan.com, and she also writes for oodles of online and print publications. In elementary school, Amy's teachers thought she chatted with friends too much. As an adult, Amy chalks up talking as a gift and happily engages with groups of any size. And I can tell you she is definitely fun to talk to. And what I wanted to talk to Amy about this week is about motherhood and faith, because when this episode releases, it is the week leading up to Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and especially my mom. Um, I really can't think of anyone else whose faith has had such an impact in my life. Um, I really need to get her get her on here to share her story because she definitely leads a life of strong faith and I am so thankful. So thanks mom. Love you. So this week we're talking to Amy Sullivan and her story is all about how her obedience led her to impact her family. Um, They were struggling like so many of us with entitlement and materialism and God really led them through steps where they are now a generous and service oriented family. And on top of that, God used their story to fulfill Amy's desire to write a book about their journey. So here's my conversation with Amy Sullivan. Amy, welcome to Feathers. Well, thank you for having me, Amy Bennett. I'm glad to be here. So excited. Um, It's going to be fun having two Amys. (laughs) I don't think I've done a call with two Amys yet. (laughs) Well, I think if if you grew up when we grew up, I don't know if you were the same way, but I always had a a solid three Amys in my class. Yes. I don't know what (laughs) happened back, I guess, in the 70s. (laughs) Yes. But um, everybody was Amy. Actually, I have to tell a funny story. Tell it. Because I went to school with Amy, another Amy. She actually... we. I'm Amy Bennett, obviously, and we both were not Amy Bennett's when we were in school, but we both married Bennett's. So now we're both Amy Bennett. Um, then last week, <laughs> I um, and we live in the same town. There's been a several times that her grandmother has sent me her birthday card. So I have to, like, you oh know, uh, get on Facebook and tell Amy, I got your birthday card. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then last week, um, we have booked a um, just a night for our kids to go to Great Wolf Lodge. And I noticed when the confirmation came up, it was a weird email address. I'm like, that's weird. I don't think I filled that in. I've never had that email. I don't know who that is. So I immediately called the 800 number, whatever, and said, you know, it went to some weird email and I need the reservation confirmation at my email. Can you send it? They were like, oh, sure. And that's that was that. Well, then I happened to get tagged the next day on Facebook that somebody is saying, my sister was like, is this you? And it was on the other Amy Bennett's Facebook page and said, and she was saying, I have been on the phone all morning with Great Wolf Lodge. They keep saying that I'm going to get a reservation next week and I keep telling me it's not me. <laughs> so it had gotten, so she had got, it was her email. They had made the, the reservation oh. under her account, everything had gone to her email and she was very confused. And it was really funny because after I um, had made the reservation and I told my daughter, I'm like, there's some other Amy Bennett out there that's very confused about next weekend. (laughs) Yes. If you have a common name, the same thing happens to me because there is an Amy Sullivan and she is an editor for Time Magazine. So I get her email all the time. <laughs> oh, gosh, and you guys are both writers, so. Right. Well, it's, her writing opportunities are a smidge more exciting <laughs> than mine, let's just say. So I'll get this, you know, somebody will be contacting me, some really big place or newspaper or whatever, and I'm, like, so excited. I'm, like, oh, yeah, they mean her. <laughs> so it's funny. All right. So, um, Amy, tell us a little bit more about your family. Sure. Well, um, I grew up south of Chicago, and lived in the Midwest the majority of my life. Uh, met my husband when I was 12, um, knew him then, but didn't actually start dating him until high school. So we've been married about 16, a little over 16 years. Um, and a 
after we were married, we moved out to Colorado for about 10 years and loved it out there, um, loved the people, loved the mountains, but just decided we were too far away from family. So we came uh, a little bit south. We live in North Carolina, and I have two girls. Um, I have Amelia, who's 12, and Ruby is six, and we live a little north of Asheville. All right. So I did not realize that you were another Carolina girl. So I'm just I'm just south of Charlotte. I'm actually in South Carolina, but I I call myself like when I go out, I'm like I'm from Charlotte. <laughs> yes, because they there there's a point where they're very close. Right. Okay. We love it. Asheville. Such an interesting city. Asheville is interesting. Yes, a little bit of everything. So we um, vacationed there for our ten year anniversary over at Grove Park Inn. Okay. Um, Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I love the spa. It was kind of like you don't want to do that a whole lot, but it was fun to, like, experience just once, you know. Oh, and it's so pretty, and there's so much history there. Everybody has stayed there. You know, presidents and, um, you know, famous people from Hollywood, and it's just such a cool old building. So it's fun to see when you come here. Yeah, and I love – I just will still always remember the – they have indoor pools, and when you're underwater, they have the music playing. So. (laughs) You like that. You're like, yes, it was like so relaxing. And then I just remember having the cheese and fruit trays brought out to us by the the outdoor pool and everything. So it was a nice treat for a 10 year anniversary. Right. And it's just I mean, they spoil you there when you're there. you, You feel spoiled and the views are awesome of the mountains. So it's just a fun time. Right. And so we are also trying to get back up there for the Biltmore. My yeah. kids, I've been, my kids have never been. Um, so that's one of those things that, you know, you living in the Carolinas, you really should just check that off your bucket list um, at some point. So. Oh, sure. And well, your kids are free. Your kids are free for a little bit anyway. Really? I did not know that. Yes. yes. Oh, man. So what's the, do you have any idea? Like, what what's the best time of year to go there? Is it spring? You know, a lot of people like spring because they do uh, a big kind of festival. They have a garden. They have all their tulips in full bloom, and so that's really pretty. I like the fall because I'm just a fall girl, <laughs> and their uh, land they have all around it and the trees surrounding it. I just think it's, it's gorgeous. But then Christmas is pretty fun, too, because they deck the place out. So Okay. I remember when I went, I mean, I was little when I went, but I just remember the the gardens and all. I think we must have went in spring. The gardens and all the flowers. And I enjoyed, I think, the outside as much as I did the inside. Oh, for sure. But, you know, it's so cool to think that they had like a bowling alley and an indoor swimming pool all, you know, way ahead of its time. So it's just, it's a neat building. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into your story today. And your story has a lot to do with um, actually your family and um, God calling you to live out um, this generous life and then also led you actually to write about it. So could you just um, walk us through the story? I'm, I'm so interested as a as a mom, too, with young kids to hear about this. Sure. Well, about I guess it was about 2011. Um, I really feel as if there was a big flood of books talking about um, living a generous life and serving others. I mean, there was uh, a hole in the gospel and radical and death by suburb, no greater love. I mean, I just felt as if every time you were turning around, there was some um, amazing book coming out. But I felt as if there wasn't a lot for families. Um And I felt as if we were really in this place where we were pretty self-consumed and focused on, you know, the next dance event or the next vacation. And we had just really worked to build a good life. And in doing so, I feel like we really left just about everything else out of our, out of our sight. And so, you know, God was just really hammering home to me, John 13, 12 through 17, but specifically when he was saying, I've set an example that you should do as I have done for you. And that's the place in scripture where he is washing the disciples feet. And that was really convicting for me that he lived as such a servant and yet we struggled to do anything. And so I really started thinking and praying about it and praying what I should do about it. I had always loved to write, but writing a Christian nonfiction parenting book was not something 
I wanted to do. You know, I wasn't, it's just, it, it wasn't something I was interested in. It, it had never been on my life's agenda checklist. I just, I just didn't want to do it. And so I just kept ignoring God and ignoring, ignoring. And I kind of felt, you know, when you're ignoring God and it just gets heavier and heavier. Louder. <laughs> yes. And you're like, I said, no, just leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> So you saw this hole, you've been a writer for a while, and you saw this hole, this gap in books, and you thought about, you started feeling this inkling to to fill that gap. Right. And that's when you were like, no. (laughs) Right. Well, and I think in knowing, if you're going to fill that gap, it actually means you need to live a certain way. And I just wasn't ready for that. You know, I thought, you, you, this isn't a book you just write. This is a book you need to live. And, you know, um, cause you work full time, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, when you, when you work full time and you have kids and, um, even if your life, life isn't slammed, you know, even if you make conscious effort to leave space in your life, it is still very, very full. And I just, it's not something I wanted to do. So I kept ignoring him and ignoring him. And really, it got to the point where I started feeling a little bit sick about it. You know, I felt as if everywhere I turned, there was um, some reminder or some someone spoke something to me that this this is what I needed to do. So I, I said, OK, God, I will I will put forth a little effort in this and I'm going to go ahead. I'll go to a writing conference. I'll pitch it. And, and that's what I'm going to do. And so if you want it, go ahead and take it. And if you don't, then this I'm free. <laughs> you know? And I think in my head. That was a little bit of a cop out because I know how hard it is to, you know, get any traction, um, especially with nonfiction books. So I went to a conference and I had never been to one before and just, you know, typed up my little proposal and pitched it. And they were like, OK, let's do this. We like it. And <laughs> I was no small like, miracle. So that's right, a little exactly. uh, mid Jesus miracle right there. Right. And so I was like, oh, wow. I was not actually thinking you were going to say yes to this. Um, So I felt like, okay, well, I need to go with it. And so I didn't know a lot about publishing. And I kind of held on with this publisher for about a year and a half where we were doing rewrites and they were kind of fitting me into a series. And then that division was cut. So a year and a half into something I don't necessarily even want to do um, and just feeling as if God wants me to do it, my opportunity, the door is closed. Mm-hmm. And, so God, and so I'm like, ha, this is great. You know, this is it. Um, but God was like, nope, not finished. You're going to you're going to do it again. And so went to another conference, pitched it again, had another publisher say, OK, we're interested. And so ended up having to rewrite it. And all this time, it's not just the writing. It really is living. It really is. I was going to um, ask, is this time where you, have you started making changes? Right. this time? Because yeah, by this time, I mean, a year and a half into it, our family is into full-blown changes. And, you know, it started out very small and very um, little baby steps of kind of engaging with our community more. Um Because really, we were, we didn't really even know the people who surrounded us, know the people in our neighborhood. Um, And so it started very small and eventually got to the point where we were pretty passionate about um, the places we were um, serving uh, and and the people we were interacting with. But I still, I still just didn't feel as if, you know, I really wanted to write about it. I, I thought, God, isn't it enough for us to just change? You know, isn't that Couldn't that be enough? So I went to another conference and pitched it again, and they said, yes, we want to make this um, like a study guide to accompany a book that's already out there. It's already published. This is going to be an easy in, you know, Um, and then that fell through again. And so I just thought, you know, God, if this is really something you want me to do, um, I'm surprised because it's, it's kind of bumpy, and this is, it's taken a long time, um, but he. I kept feeling the, the the heaviness and the pressure that we should go on, and and um, a small press picked it up, and I thought this is it, this is going to be it, and it's it's small, and I'm going to get lots of attention, and I will tell you from beginning to publication, just about every bump in the road you could hit, we we hit. And it was really hard for me because I thought, number one, I don't like to be vulnerable and put myself out there. And I felt as if I was doing that. And two, I tend to be really results driven. And so 
I feel like all these false starts and then starting again, um, that, that was really, it was really, really hard for me, uh, just to, just to go through that and, and to watch something that I struggled to put out, um, you know, meet, be met with kind of so many walls. But then as, as, as we got a little bit more into the process and as our family decided we were going to give the, uh, the profit we made to a nonprofit that we had been engaging with and that we had been involved, volunteering with. And, um, this was a home for women and children who the mothers there suffered with, from drug and alcohol problems. And it was a perfect fit for us and for my family because my mom really struggled to raise my sister and I, and she battled alcoholism her entire life. And so it was neat to be able to um, really get to know these women and to encourage these women at, at this nonprofit. And so I think once we, once we joined with the nonprofit, I think um, my attitude changed a little bit. And I started learning that sometimes God asks us to do things and our job is just to obey. And that's a really um, tough lesson to learn, especially when, like I said, I am results driven and I have an agenda as to what I want it to look like. But to just give that over to God and, and, and you know, God says, you know, I've asked you, you need to do it. You need to love people well and encourage people. And then you need to tell others about it. And so at that point, it was pretty life changing for us. OK, so can you talk a little bit more? And I love that because it really is. We think it's going to go one way. And I hear this over and over again, is that God calls us to something and we think it's going to go one way. And then it just totally flips on us and turns out another way. So really, this this book that you were writing, you didn't want to write. You didn't want to live, ended up working out and being able to be a blessing in itself, not just the words, but the prophets as well. Right. And I think the whole process of of writing it um, and of forcing me to um, be obedient was something that was very new, because in addition to being pretty selfish with with our time and our life, I feel as if we were demonstrating kind of this fake obedience where we were obedient. Our family was obedient with things we wanted to be obedient with, but otherwise, Mm -hmm. and so we felt good about that and we looked good, but we were never faced with the hard things when it's hard to be obedient, when you don't see results right away or when things don't go your way. We, we weren't experiencing any of that. And this, and this forced us to a little bit. So can you talk a little bit more about that? You said you guys started out small, yes. and then it sounds like you got into some harder things where it's harder to obey, harder to serve. Can you can you start us out with maybe some of the small things and then just give us a picture of what maybe that looks like in progression? Sure. I mean, for as far as for the serving, um, we started out our very, very first act. Um, Disney was actually running this campaign, and it was called Give a Day, Get a Day where you volunteered for a day and they would give you a free day at Disney World for every single person in your family. So I was like, oh, wouldn't this be great to get our family excited? You know, um, Disney isn't something we do. And so this would this would be like a fun, a great kickoff. And and when we had decided we were going to go pack uh, food bags at a local shelter. And and when I told my family about it, You know, our oldest was kind of like, well, I don't know anybody who doesn't have enough to eat. And our youngest was totally disengaged. And my husband was thinking, oh, I feel like, you know, I have a game that day. And I just thought, oh, my goodness, we can't even we can't even do this with a care of Disney hanging in front of us. Um, And so that was kind of where we started. But we did end up going that day. And I will tell you just that two hour span of time where we were packing these bags and they were lunch bags. Um. And working with people we didn't know, we had great conversation. We met tons of people who were different than us. We got to really talk to our daughter about people who don't have enough to eat, 
um, and people in our community who don't have enough to eat. And so it was just the very first baby step. And from there, what we did is we went out and we tried a lot of different things. I mean, we have done things with, you know, senior citizens, with animals, and, and just kind of like it was just we're going to try everything until we kind of find out what speaks to our family and what what our kids like to do and what what we feel called to do. And that was fun because what I saw is every single person in our family had different interests. And so we kind of plugged in in different ways. It wasn't just we all showed up and started doing something like my husband um, started coaching um, more and for a different type of kid. And the, the relationships he's made there were invaluable, you know, just um, really mentoring kids that way. I um, took our oldest and we worked at the women's shelter that I talked to about a little bit where we're donating the proceeds to. And so um, for her to get to know some of the people there and some of the kids there and just be a part of that community and, and get to see people come in and then leave successful and moving into their own apartment and, um, faith, you know, kind of conquer issues that have followed them around a little bit. That was neat. And so just really, um, finding our own passion, even in our kids was, was kind of a cool thing. I love that. And so, I mean, when you think about um, scripture and how that plays a part into either your obedience in writing the book or, or living the book um, and something maybe that, that has helped you and spurred you on through this, what would you share with people? I mean, I think through this, the part about me not wanting to be vulnerable and and put myself out there and put my family out there and and. And, and the part with obedience as well, Joshua 1.9 was kind of what was guiding us. And it's it says, have I not commanded you, be strong, you know, be courageous, do not be terrified, don't be discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that is something that I carried with me, that even though um, living and writing this story wasn't something I had planned, God was with us. He was with us every step. And even when it didn't turn out like we expected, it was still something he was asking us to do. And so it was an encouragement through the entire process. And, you know, even even still now, even without writing, if you just talk about any life situation, just knowing that, at, especially at those times when we do feel ter- terrified and that we need that reassurance to be strong, that that's a verse that I cling to. And I love, too, that... Um the whole writing thing, even though God called you to it, it wasn't smooth sailing. Oh, that, yeah. You know, it's like you were called this way and it's a closed door and you go over here and it's a closed door. And yet you persevered and you were, you know, and I think that's being courageous that you followed that voice of God to say on the outside, it kind of looks like it's not working out. But I, on the inside, I can feel your voice telling me to go this way. Well, so I'm going to keep going. It is. And, you know, you start to question yourself, like you start to say, well, I like to write. Is this just me trying to be self-serving? You know, is this me wanting to do that? And I prayed a lot about that, but I knew it wasn't true because I knew this part of it wasn't what I wanted. You know, maybe if it was a book about something else, I could have said that. But I know you can relate to that because with your book, you know, I'm sure that's not a topic that you wanted to write. You didn't want to put it out there. But when God leads you to there it's it gets to the point where it's hard to say no yes i can't tell you how many times my poor friend danny we would sit at starbucks and i would talk about it i'm like oh i think i'm supposed to write about it oh i don't want to do that uh i think i'm supposed to write about it and i mean for i I can't even tell you for how long um but it was a very long time that i resisted writing about it um and yet i mean it's been years now since the book my book um, is about my emotional affair for anybody who doesn't know and still get emails to this day to say that I relate to what you wrote about. I see now what I'm doing in my marriage and I'm going to stop. And in some cases, some women have told me I am the only person in the whole world they have told that it's going on. Um, so I can see the power and how right. <laughs> the power of that. And it's like, wow, it's like little me sitting at Starbucks, you know, sharing the most and talking about being vulnerable. Oh, my gosh. Sharing the most vulnerable, vulnerable part of me um, could that God could <laughs> could use that. And it's right. and it's like the worst part. It's I just think of um, 
you know, Joseph and the what was meant for evil is being used for good. And it's what I did that was evil and sinful. And God is still using it for good. And that's just his grace. Well, and, and that's kind of how I feel like with this writing process. I feel as if God, you know, was just dragging me along. And in the end, it's like we have the biggest blessing of all. You know, he has blessed us by really creating a deep change in us. I mean, we are the people who really know our neighbors and are really engaged in, you know, the barbecues and knowing who's where and knowing who needs what. Um, whereas before we were so closed off and I think of all the relationships that we would have missed out on, you know, if, if we would have dug our feet in and said, no, this just isn't for us. And so even though God had to drag us, we still ended up with a tremendous blessing. No, I love your book because you give like very practical things to do and even just starting the conversation with your family. Can you talk a little about your book and um, some of those things that you suggest as next steps for families? Yeah, I mean, the book is just um, it really is. Like I said, part of the reason I wanted to write it is because I wanted something practical. So I feel like it's just a fun, easy read and there's not a lot of guilt in as far as um, trying to guilt you into one way or the other. But it basically divides. Um, it up into being generous in seven different ways with strangers, with forgiveness, with your talent, your time. And, and it looks at just a whole new um, way of seeing generosity instead of just seeing, oh, we have to sh- show up at, you know, a homeless shelter. That's the only way we can serve. It really tries. I try to delve into other ways. Like you can really be generous by forgiving that friend that you've held a grudge, you know, with for so many years and you can be generous by um, donating your time as far as you know making crafts if you're a craft person or whatever but try to explore different ways and so um, hopefully it's a new look at it and not just we're supposed to show up and serve but that we get to Right. And well, I just have to say thank you so much for writing it. Um, This is definitely a topic with three kids that um, that I want to be passionate about. I don't think our family is there yet, to be honest. Um, and I'm so challenged by it. So thank you from our family for writing it. <laughs> well, you're well, you're welcome. And I don't think that anybody's ever really there or ever really arrived. I think there's stuff that we all struggle with there. But I think just putting that at the forefront of our head, um, and it makes it easier to and to be able to be more aware of, of opportunities and of people that surround us every day. All right. So thank you so much for coming on today, Amy. If people want to find you on your blog or the book, where can they go? Um, they can find me online at emailsullivan.com and they can find the book um, on Amazon and on Barnes and Noble. And actually right now, I believe the Kindle version is 99 cents the last time I checked. And so I don't know how long the publisher will hold it there for, but it is 99 cents now. So it's on sale. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much for being on today. Thank you. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Amy. I love her story because it's such a reminder to me how our faith influences our families. Um, We talked a little bit about that when Amanda White was on a couple episodes ago. Um, And I know for them, it wasn't probably easy the first few times they went out on service projects. It was probably uncomfortable and awkward. But you can hear the joy in Amy's voice when she talks about serving her community. And really, I mean, isn't that what faith is about? It's really the steps God takes us on for us to know him better and then also to join him where he's at work, to love others and help them know him too. Another thing about Amy's story is that God wanted her to share her story. And in some sort of way, I think God calls us all to do that. Um, You know, he says that we are to be witnesses for him. And that's just simply telling others about the work he's done in our lives. Um, Sometimes it's through a book and sometimes it's just opening up over coffee. Um, In both cases, to step out in faith that way, you, you have to accept some vulnerability. Um, So I just want to encourage you all to share your story. I know some of you are writers, and maybe there's that one story you haven't opened up about, even though God keeps poking you to do it. Um, Or maybe you see somebody else that's in a situation that God has helped you through, and you might just encourage them if you'd open up. So whatever it is, I'm praying that you can step out in faith and be the witness God has called you to be. 
All right. So guys, you can find show notes over at featherspodcast.com. And also, if you haven't left a review over on iTunes, I would really appreciate it. It really helps others decide whether to listen to the podcast. So thank you so much to those that have done that already. All right. So we will see you next time on Feathers. Feathers.